Let's hear it for somebody that feels free today. Glory. Glory. All right, give somebody a, a high five or a fist bump. Somebody you don't know, didn't say hi to earlier, and then have a seat. Then have a seat. Hey, uh, if there are any Utes in here, the Utes, uh, they are having Pastor Anthony just snuck up behind me and scared me uh, to death. I almost screamed like a little girl. Um, and uh, they, they are going. So uh, youth, there are uh, many of them already left, but there's still some here in the room. If you want to go, uh, now is your time to go. A couple of things. I want to take a moment, look in the lens and say good morning to everybody watching online, wherever you're dialed in from. Thanks for joining us on this Palm Sunday. My name is Pastor Michael. I'm one of the pastors here at the church, and we're excited to have you with us wherever you are joined in from. Those of you here in-house, hey, good morning, balcony people. Hello, Nave. Right side. I see her right there. Psst. Left side. <laughs> I was like, I see. I don't know what she's doing. What is she doing back there all day? Bomb. Um, so. Um, some of you caught that movie reference. Okay, so a couple of things. Today is Palm Sunday, which is why I'm wearing purple. I've gotten comments about it all day long, like, TCU lost, they're not in the tournament anymore. I get it, okay? We had a bad game. Um, guess what? Some of y'all are going to lose today, so get over yourselves. Some of you last lost, not la lost last night. Um, but it is Palm Sunday, and it is the, the, the liturgical color of the season is purple, and it plays into what we're talking about today. But a couple of other things as we launch into Holy Week, Batman. Um, Thursday, we're doing our Seder meal. And uh, if you've never been to one of our Seder meals, they're awesome. They're so much fun. I encourage you to come. I believe we still have some spots left. You can talk to Dana um, in the back after church or just go right now. I don't care. Um, and talk with her about that. Friday, we do our Journey to the Cross. And it's all over campus. We're going to stop. It starts out here um, by the, the fountain. Um, behind me, and it journeys through, and you come back around to the cross that's there. Uh, it's a really a very powerful thing uh, to walk through on um, on Good Friday, and, and so we would love for you to come out during the, the morning time, daytime, uh, to walk through that. And then on Easter Sunday, we're going to have our regular Easter services, uh, 9, 15, 9, 30, and 11. Uh, 11 o'clock, we anticipate being the fullest of the services. If you're a regular 11 o'clocker, but you're like, you know what, we can go to 9, 30 today, or even go to 9, 15, that would be awesome. Um, and also, please try to utilize, let's be good neighbors, like a good neighbor, park in the west side. Please, <clears throat> if you would park in our west, uh, west parking lot, that would be awesome. Um, there's a lot of spots back there. Uh, you'll notice that's where I park, if you know what I drive. If you don't, stop trying to find out what I drive. Um, but it, it's back, uh, it, so please uh, it, utilize, if you can, if you're able, if you need to park close, go ahead and, and park close. But um, that's what's coming. We're excited about it. Oh, Wednesday through th uh, Friday of this week, from 7.30 a.m., to 9 a.m., we have our drive-through prayer once again, um, and it was awesome. The last time we did this, they prayed for hundreds of people. They uh, walked through. People were walking by. We prayed for walk-bys. Uh, we prayed for dogs um, as well. We didn't pray for any cats because we have standards around here at St. Andrews. Um, so we would love for you to come, 7.30 a.m. to 9 um, over in the west parking lot. Uh, if you're taking your kids uh, to school, you're going to work or whatever, you just drive by. Um, have one of our prayer team pray over you during this, this holy week. So Thanks for the prayer team for, for doing that Wednesday through Friday. Now, today is Palm Sunday, and we are going to talk about, uh, we're in this spiritual renaissance um, series. This is our third week in this series. <clears throat> and what we've been talking about is there are so many different depictions of art through paintings, sculptures, poetry, music, different, different creations, stained glass, whatever it is, that depict the stories that are contained from Genesis to Revelation. Just thousands and thousands over the years of people have just set out to really visually tell the story of what's written or what was orally traditionally told from generation to generation. For me, I talked about this last week, I'm such a visually oriented person, I love this kind of stuff. I really get into seeing the pictures and seeing how somebody else, because when I hear stories, I automatically have pictures that pop into my head, but it's great to see someone else's interpretation of it because sometimes it brings a new element out for me, or it's a little bit more powerful than maybe I was giving it credit for. And so I've really enjoyed this. I hope you have too. I've, I've gotten a lot of positive feedback from it. Those of you who have negative, negative feedback, I don't care. Um, so I, I've been excited about this. So we have this one, and then we have one more next week. We are gonna do, it on, do one on Easter Sunday. But this one, we, we began, if you were here, with the Lord's Supper, with Da Vinci's Lord's Supper, and we talked about it. Like, 
it's, that's not how it happened. And I, I was kind of critical of Da Vinci, uh, of things. And I said, well, these are the things, and let's pick it apart. It's kind of similar today, but I'm going to see it differently. So the painting we're going to talk about today is a four foot by six foot, Masamenos, painting. It's oil on panel. that was commissioned by a, a guy in Antwerp. Uh, and I know everyone knows where Antwerp is. Um, it's in the north part of Belgium. Uh, Nicholas Jürgenklink. I think that's exactly how you pronounce it. Um, Nicholas Jürgen Klink um, uh, commissioned it, and he was a banker in Antwerp, and he was known for being a banker, but also for his really incredible, vast collection of art. Um, and he, he's got artists from all over the place, but he had one guy in particular who he has 16 works from this guy. His name was Peter Bruegel, and that is how you pronounce it, because there was a little speaker next to the thing, and I, I played it like 10 times. Peter Bruegel which almost sounds Hebraic, really. That's a good Hebrew word, is the Taka Belugi, and you're speaking Jewish. Uh, Peter Bruchel, um, and, and he had all these people, and Peter was known, he was part of the Netherlands Renaissance movement, the Dutch Renaissance kind of period. And he was known for doing some really weird things, except for this picture. They, they say he backed away from kind of his normal tendencies and fell into two different art categories. I know some of you are really bored by this, but there's three of you that care. Um, it, it's the Antwerp school and also mannerism were the two things he kind of picked up on and that he really led. And the reason they said they believe that he did this is because the sacredness that he felt of this particular painting. So in 1564, Nicholas asked Peter to paint the procession to Calvary. And this is what he came up with. Now, I know what you're thinking. It looks like a blob. It looks like an impressionistic picture where if I go further away, it makes more sense, but I'm really far away from it right now and it makes no sense at all. Unless you're sitting close enough that you can see some of the details. Again, balcony people, y'all the best seats, just turn around. There's a big one right behind you. Um, I encourage you, uh, I got onto somebody earlier because he was on his phone during worship time and he was texting. He wasn't looking this up, he was texting and you know who you are. Um, uh, it, pull your phone out and Google Peter Bruegel the procession of Calvary, and you can see it in, uh, up close uh, and, and personal because there are some really cool details on this that I want to point out to you. Um, a couple of things. One, the Antwerp School was known kind of for their, their big geographic, uh, ge geography structures, geological structures, and, and you see in the middle of this that, that there's this really weird rock outcropping that would not have been common um, in the area of Flanders where he was uh, painting this, um, in Antwerp, Flanders area. Um, but he it, it was this kind of this Antwerp school to show that this is Israel, even though it's not, because if you look at the top of that mountain, what's on top of it? Can anybody see what's on top of it? It's a windmill. It's a Dutch windmill. So you know that you're placed um, there in, in the Dutch, the Belgium, northern Belgium, Netherlands area. Um, and and, and, and but beside this, so, so on the left side of the picture is Jerusalem. At the very back left side is Jerusalem. And you have this wall that surrounds it in a circular fashion. On the other side of that, up the top of Golgotha, which is what that is, you have this black circle. And so what he's pointing out here is that on the left side is, is life and safety in Jerusalem. On the right side is death and exposure. If you look inside that black circle, there's two crosses that are already erected. In between those two crosses, you see guys digging a hole in anticipation of the cross that's about to be placed in the center. So you have this wonderful, and that black circle, by the way, is made up of people. Because what Peter was trying to portray is the, the great carnival-like experience that executions were in 1564. Because we know that, um, that Jesus was not indeed crucified in the Netherlands. It was in Jerusalem. And what you might be saying is, well, Michael, you got onto Leonardo da Vinci for painting the Last Supper in a way that was relevant to his time period, and yet you don't seem to be hammering Peter Bruegel about this. Well, no, and, and, and there's a reason why. So a couple other things about this before we get into that. So the left side, you see this tree kind of sticking out over and covering Jerusalem, um, this beautiful tree, and they call that the Tree of Life. On the right side, you see um, there's, can anyone up close or in the balcony tell what that is at the very top right? what it looks like? It's a wheel. It's a wagon wheel on a big, huge, tall post. And it was called a breaking wheel, or 
the uh, St. Catherine's wheel. And it was the form of execution most widely used during this time period, 100 years before, and they, they outlawed it a few hundred, maybe 100 years after this time period. But the breaking wheel, if you look on the right side, so you have this tree of life on the left side covering Jerusalem, and you have this death, tree of death um, covering Golgotha on the other side. Incidentally, and I don't know why he did this, the artist depicts himself hanging onto the tree of death. Um, and, uh, and then the, the guy who commissioned him um, Nicholas is standing there next to him. But this breaking wheel, what they would do is they would literally break the bones of the person that was going to be executed. They would break their legs, break their arms, and then they would strap them onto the wheel and kind of weave their arms and legs in through the spokes. Then they would strap them on so they wouldn't fall. They would stick them on top of this pole and raise it into the sky, and they would leave them to die of exposure and being eaten by birds. Yeah, that should get you to say, ugh. In fact, there's, he has a bird and a piece of clothing hanging on that um, from the last victim on that wheel that's up on the right corner there. The, the longest, they say, recorded anyone survived on top of the wheel was nine days. Can you imagine how horrible that experience would have been? To the left of Golgotha, that black circle, are more of these trees of death, more of these breaking wheels that are lined up the same way Romans would have lined up crosses to tell people, you don't step out of line here. Because what's happening is a couple of things. One, he's trying to capture the sacredness of this moment. Because there is, it's execution and it's horrific, but let's not kid ourselves. It's sacred. It's a beautiful moment. In fact, he moves, if you look at the very front right-hand corner, it's Mary. And she's kind of set apart. And she has John, who's attending her, leaning over her. And the other Marys are beside her. And they're kind of in this group. They're much bigger than everybody else, which is a manneristic style. that Some things are way out of proportion than others. And, and you have them out front. They're kind of, everyone else is going on about the business of what's going to happen with this execution. But they seem to be in a drama of, of themselves. And he, and he sets her apart as this beautiful kind of representation of what she was going through in that moment. Then if you, if you try to find Jesus, it's just like, where's Waldo? Where's Jesus in this? Does anybody see Jesus in this? Does anyone take a guess of where he is? The center. Yeah, that's, a, that's always a great call there. Um, uh, yeah, he's in the center. But he's very small. And again, this is mannerism at play. While we would argue that he's the most important aspect of this picture because it's a procession to Calvary focusing on him, Peter wants you to see something different. Now he does, and he agrees, which is why Jesus is at the center, and he's fallen down. He's the only one who's in a, a appropriate, he's the only one appropriately dressed for the time period that this would have taken place. He's dressed as if he would have been when he actually walked up the hill. No one else is. Everybody else is dressed in the time period of 1564. So you have Jesus who is down on the ground, essentially, and he has the cross on top of him. And there's a few people around him. To the right of him, is a cart, and inside that cart are the two criminals that are about to be put on the crosses on either side of Jesus. They're both, incidentally, if you zero in on this, um, they're holding crosses in their hands, and they have priests sitting next to them. Again, a cross was not something that was used in this way the time that those two guys were crucified next to Jesus. That came much later that people started using that as a symbol of God and God's mercy, even though it's an act of brutality. So you have that moment right there. But if you notice, with the exception of Mary and her group and like three people right around Jesus, everyone is focused on something. Everyone is looking, like all the people in the red coats, the people in the red coats, they're not British, they're Spanish. These are the Spanish soldiers and authorities because at this time, the area of Flanders was ruled by Spain, viciously ruled by Spain. That these executions, which is why he puts these trees of death up there, were commonplace for people that the king described as heretics, which meant you didn't bow down to him. And so you have these executions all the time, and it was kind of a festival and a carnival atmosphere, which he's trying to paint. But then everybody's looking back towards the bottom left of this painting. And at the bottom left of this painting, you see a woman, and she's dressed in red, white, and green, and she's holding on to something. Below her is this lamb it looks like it's just fallen down and a jar that spilled something. This is a subtle, subtle, beautiful hint of what, of what Peter's doing there. Because when we think of the lamb, we think of who? 
Jesus. It's okay to say Jesus out loud in church, folks. It's all right. He, he hears his name all the time. Um, and, and so, yeah, we think of Jesus. But what they're focused on is what she's grabbing hold of and, and, and who she's grabbing hold of. Who she's grabbing hold of is Simon. Now, you're like, who's Simon? Hold that thought. <clears throat> Mark chapter 15. Very early in the morning, the leading priests, the elders, and the teachers of religious law, the entire high council, met to discuss their next step. They bound Jesus, led him away, and took him to Pilate, the Roman governor. Pilate asked Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus replied, you have said it. Then the leading priest kept accusing him of many crimes, and Pilate asked him, aren't you going to answer any of them? What about all these charges they are bringing against you? But Jesus said nothing, much to Pilate's surprise. Now it was the governor's custom each year during the Passover celebration to release one prisoner, anyone the people requested. One of the prisoners at that time was Barabbas, a revolutionary who had committed murder in an uprising. The crowd went to Pilate and asked him to release a prisoner as usual. Would you like me to release to you this king of the Jews, Pilate asked, for he realized by now that the leading priests had arrested Jesus out of envy. But at this point, the leading priests stirred up the crowd to demand the release of Barabbas instead of Jesus. Pilate asked them, then what should I do with this man you call the king of the Jews? They shouted back, crucify him. Why, Pilate demanded, what crime has he committed? But the mob roared even louder, crucify him. So to pacify the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. He ordered Jesus flogged with a lead-tipped whip, then turned him over to the Roman soldiers to be crucified. The soldiers took Jesus into the courtyard of the governor's headquarters called the Praetorium and called out the entire regiment. They dressed him in a purple robe and they wove thorn branches into a crown and put it on his head. And then they saluted him and taunted, Hail, King of the Jews! And they struck him on the head with a stick, spit on him, and dropped to their knees in mock worship. And they were finally tired of mocking him. They took off the purple robe and put his own clothes on him again. And then they led him away to be crucified. A passerby named Simon, who was from Cyrene, was coming in from the countryside just then. And the soldiers forced him to carry Jesus' cross. Simon was the father of Alexander and Rufus. And they brought Jesus to a place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull. So this is the depiction of what Bruegel is painting. He's painting this moment, this the procession to Calvary. And it's an interesting thing because as you read this, one of the things first is how horrific this is. To, to really understand what's happening here, you, you have to understand what they did to Jesus before they even put him on the cross. They took this cat of nine tails, as it was called. And it was a piece of, uh, it was a whip with a whole bunch of leather strands that came off of it that had bits of rock and bone tied to it. And they would start at the shoulders and whip them, digging it into the flesh and pulling it back out. And they would work their way down the back, through the butt, down the thighs, all the way to the ankles. 39 times. His back was open, raw, exposed. Muscle, sinew, blood everywhere. And then they put a robe on it. Can you imagine how painful it already was? And then think of an open wound in which you have some big cloth put on it and then left there for a while and then ripped back off. Not to mention the crown of thorns and and all the stuff that was going on with Jesus. So what was going on here? This is a political move. It, it was a move for control of power. It was a move by those who were being oppressed but had a sense of power by, and, and those who had the power and were the oppressors. See, the Pharisees and the high priests and, and the, the leading council, they had power. Sure, they were part of the Jewish family and they were oppressed by the Romans, but they had power. They had power so much so that their life was pretty good and they had a whole lot of things that came to them because of their position. If they just kept the peace, if the status quo just went on, even if they went against some of the things they knew to be true, everything would be okay. 
But here comes this guy, and he's disrupting all of it. Here comes this guy, and he's threatening the very power that they have hold on, held on to for so long. And they can't let that happen. Problem is, they don't have any authority to do anything about it. They can throw him in the temple, they can do that, but they need him to be gone, and in order for him to be executed, they have to go to the Romans, because only the Romans had that kind of power. So they go to Pilate, Rome, essentially, in Jerusalem. And they go to him and they plead with him, hey, we, this guy, he's done it all. But here's the thing, the charges that they were bringing against Jesus didn't elevate to a level of execution. And Pilate's like, this doesn't matter. Why am I getting involved in this? Even Mark points it out, he knew that they were just envious of his popularity and the fact that people were listening to him and changing their lives because of what he was teaching. This isn't my problem. But see, Pilate did have a problem and his problem was he needed to keep peace in Jerusalem. Because his job, his whole job was to keep everything in Jerusalem. Those crazy Jews were always having uprisings. So much so that they even talk about one of the uprisings and one of the guys who committed murder during it named Barabbas. The Jews, they were this just powder keg of just going nuts. And it's like Rome said, hey, as long as you keep things quiet, I don't care what you do. And maybe your next post will be better than Jerusalem. And that's what Pilate wanted. In Scripture, we have different stories about Pilate, but if you read historical accounts of who this man was, he was very violent. Like, we look at this and we're like, well, he didn't really want to kill Jesus. Maybe he wasn't, he wasn't very violent. No, he was. He just didn't want to get involved in the politics of the religion. But in order to keep peace, he gave the order. Crucify him. You have this... This, these two different organizations. The religion of the day, which I would argue is acting way more like the kingdom of the world and the greatest kingdom of the world of the day against the one who would change everything. And you remember what Jesus said in the face of all of this? Nothing. He answered one question. You're the king of the Jews? So you say Nothing you do is going to change what's going to happen here, my brother. You have this powerful moment. And so, so what I want you to watch is I want to watch you. And this is why I think what Bruchel does is different than what da Vinci did. Because he's not trying to rewrite the story. What he's trying to do is he's trying to get people of 1564 to understand what the story looks like for them right now. Because they knew what it was like to live under oppression because Spain was doing that. He paints this whole picture. You know what it's like. You know what it's like to have somebody who doesn't live here control you, tell you what you have to think, what you can think, who you are, tell you about your kids, all this stuff. And every time you, anytime you step out, they're gonna put you on a, a wheel. But look at this guy in the center. He said, bring it on. He said, bring it on. But remember, that's not where everybody's gaze is. Everybody's looking back towards Simon. So what do we know about Simon? Simon, we, we know he's from Cyrene. Okay, what does that mean? He's from North Africa. He's, he's a guy who came in, it's Passover, and every Jew's dream is to celebrate Passover in Jerusalem. In fact, if you've ever been to our Seder meal or any Seder meal, what's the last line of every Seder meal? Next year in Jerusalem. That's the last line every time. Because it's a, it's a dream, like, oh, man, if I could only celebrate Passover in Jerusalem. Oh, if I could only just, and so who knows how long Simon had been saving his money, planning for this trip, making this moment. He gets into Jerusalem. Hundreds of thousands of people crowd the city at this time. There's people everywhere celebrating God. Yahweh is great in the pageantry and the amazingness. You feel close to the temple and all this great stuff. There he is. He's in this moment, and all of a sudden, everything changes. Because here goes this guy, he doesn't know really much anything about him. He came in last week and people seem to be excited. But who is he and why, is, why are they killing him? He must be bad if they're crucifying him. And a Roman soldier gets in and, and the Greek word is conscripted that he just grabs this guy and he says, you better carry this cross. So Simon carries the cross. But what, what happened after? You, know, you, you don't really hear anything else about him, but did you hear what Mark said in there? So, so Mark's writing this gospel, and it's, I believe it's a lot of Peter's account to the church of Rome. 
And he's, he's writing to the Romans, and what he says is, he tells the story of Simon, and he goes, hey, oh, by the way, Simon is the dad of Alexander and Rufus. What? Who are, who's Alexander and Rufus? Right? Uh, isn't that a weird statement? Does anybody remember those little, that little parenthetical statement of Mark? He's like, oh, by the way, that's Alexander and Rufus' dad. Here's what's happening. There's a guy named Alexander and two brothers, Alexander and Rufus, in the church of Rome that are so well known by the church of Rome and the Roman people that Mark name drops them. Hey, remember these guys? That's their dad. Oh. Paul, in the letter to Romans, when he sends his salutations and does that, he does this all the time in letters, he goes, be sure to mention and say hi to my brother Rufus and say hi to his mother who was like a mother to me. Hey, let me tell you, you don't call somebody's mother like a mother to you unless you know them well. You know what I'm saying? You ain't saying like, hey, I'm gonna talk to your boys on here, but Jax and Jay, say hi to your mom. She's like a mom to me, Ms. Harvey. That's just weird. Unless there's that deep connection. Paul knew Rufus. See, Simon went to Jerusalem as a Jew, but he left as a believer in Jesus. He went in the oppressive force of, of Rome everywhere, and he goes in and he has this encounter when he carried the cross with Christ, and he changed everything, and I know this because Alexander and Rufus existed. Everything about him in the face of oppression, he went back and he was a father who poured into his kids and says, I don't care what Rome says, we follow Jesus. I don't care what the church says or the religious elite say, we follow Jesus. If it's not in his words and not in this book, we're not going to follow it. Bruegel was trying to get across to Flanders in 1564 that it wasn't the Spanish king who was in charge, it was the one in the center of that picture. And we need people to walk out and say, I'm going to carry that cross with you. Let me tell you, in 2024, it is not what the government says. It's not what social media says. It's not what Hollywood says that determines who we are as a person. It is what this says. And if our kids don't see that, Amen. what this painting says to me is that we need some Simons to be conscripted into the army of God. We need some people who are willing to say, here I am, Lord, just like Moses did. I don't know what you're going to ask me to do, but I'm going to pick up that cross and follow you. Because I need my kids to understand that it's not what the world says about them, it's what God says about them. This is a call to arms and a call to victory because you think this day ended in death? It ended in victory. Because Jesus said, not on my watch are any of my children going to perish. As long as they come to me, I offer them life. Are you a Simon today? Some of you are in a position to be a Simon, and some of us, we need to understand that we have Alexanders and Rufuses growing up in our house. Come on, praise Jesus, I didn't name my son Rufus. He's saying hallelujah on the front row. But we need to understand that while we don't live in the time period where Rome was oppressing the Jews, in the first century, and we don't live in the same time period that Spain was oppressing the people of Belgium in the 1500s. We are oppressed today if you believe in Jesus Christ. And you may roll your eyes to that, but I believe it. The survey that said, that just came out, that the Pew Research did, 80% of Americans believe that the church is in decline today. I believe that too. 57% of them say that's a bad thing. We've lost our way. And I think it's because we've allowed the oppressors who are controlling the narrative more voice than the one who wrote it. We need Simons to step up today. And we need to raise Alexanders and Rufuses. Let us pray. Father, we thank you and praise you for your son, Jesus who gave his life so that we might have ours. And God, I thank you for those men and women who followed him, who in the, in the midst of oppression and their lives are on the line, they stepped forward and said, I will pick up this cross and follow you. I will go with you. Because of how they live, generations later, we still continue to tell your story. Even sometimes in a place that tries to shut us down that tries to tell us what we know to be true, the way, the truth, and the life isn't really true. 
God, I pray that you would give us the courage to take that narrative back. That you would give us the courage to be Simons, to be Alexanders and Rufuses, to go into a world proclaiming your goodness and your glory. God, I pray if there's anyone in this room who, who's never understood what it feels like to be free. See, the, the tree of death that Bruegel painted was a tree of freedom because it was his death, but that death could not contain him. As we acknowledge and accept that gift, we step into that life. And so, Father, I pray if anyone needs to feel that life today, that they would say yes to you. That they would say, I'm tired of letting the world rule my life. I want the kingdom of God to rule. Father, those of us who know that, who've been there, may we have the courage to not hide it as a part of who we are, but to lead with that to be your sons and daughters proclaiming your glory in a world that needs to hear it. Father, we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. The ushers are coming forward this, this morning, and, and we do the offertory here. It's, it's an act of worship for us at St. Andrews. I know we have a lot of guests here, but this is, this is an act of worship. We worship through, through song, through prayer, through word, through silence, but we also worship um, in how we give. And, and so I want to say a blessing on this act of worship today. Father, we thank you and praise you for all that we have, all that we have is yours. And so we now take a moment to worship you and to give some of it back to you. May you receive this offering through the power of the Holy Spirit, magnify its use that others may know they're loved by you. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name, amen. God sent his son. They call him Jesus. He came to love, heal and forgive. He bled and died to buy my pardon. with your whole heart and your hands open receive this blessing may the lord bless you and keep you may the lord make his face to shine upon you lift his countenance unto you and give you his peace amen amen have a blessed sunday wonderful week and we'll see you for easter